It is a jam-packed session, so bear with me while we go through lots and lots of topics. So we'll try and touch upon some of the most relevant part uh, regarding the respiratory system. We'll be talking about asthma, a little bit about spirometry, COPD, and with COPD, a bit of ABGs, serial blood gases, a little bit of pneumonia, a little bit of pneumothorax, a little bit of pleural effusion. <laughs> You'll see the very brief slides and a bit about a P. And unfortunately, in this series, we're not going to be able to cover pulmonary fibrosis and ILD, but there is a very good lecture series by QuestMed. All right. So let's start with the first question. Let's get right in there. I'll give you a minute just to read. Very good. This is a bit of a warming up question. Just to introduce the topic of asthma. Again, it's going to be a little bit of an overview. There's a very good in-depth lecture series about this, but talking about asthma, incredibly common, especially in the UK. And when we talk about asthma, we talk about a chronic inflammatory airway condition. So for your exams, guys, it's very important to memorize some sort of definition of asthma and to just be able to read it off. The key words that you're going to have to mention, things like chronic inflammatory condition and the way it differentiates from other obstructive airway conditions is that it is reversible. The main components of asthma um, revolve around three main uh, aspects, bronchospasm, inflammation, and mucus plugging and mucus production. Patients will have individual triggers, which you will have to try and elicit in a history, try and figure out what is that makes everyone's asthma a little bit worse. And remember that because this is a chronic condition, it can have a really significant impact on people's quality of life. Um, you know, Although a lot of asthma tends to sort of affect children and resolve up to a certain age, lots, lots of patients will carry on having asthma later on in life. Um, and there's things that you might not think about so much, but sleep quality um, has you know, massive impact, impacted by asthma, um, days off school in particular for children or employment, and just limitation of their activities and employability, you know, if we're looking at it from a wider context. Um, a little bit of something else to think about, you know, if we talk about other potential differentials, think about slightly rogue things like gourd and, you know, um, reflux. Um, the little picture just shows some of the main symptoms of asthma that patients will be coming to you with. Breathlessness, maybe a more obvious one, but things you'll be looking out for is tight chest and a cough which is dry and tends to be worse at night. You know, differentials for just a cough would be sort of post-nasal drip. But if you have a series of symptoms, especially more than one of these, um, including wheezing, and then you're more likely to be looking at asthma. So this is what I was talking about earlier, some of the main pathogenesis of asthma. That I'm sure you all know about. It is very helpful to keep in mind when you're thinking about the treatment of asthma. If you look at a normal bronchial tube, you know, the smooth muscle is relaxed and the alveolar are clogged up. Um, but uh, a somatic bronchial tube will be inflamed um, with tightened muscles, swelling and mucus plugging. And if you think about the medications that we use for asthma, having this overview of the pathogenesis really helps put them, put them together. So for instance, bronchodilators such as salbutamol, you know, will be luck looking at acting mainly on smooth muscle. While well, instead corticosteroids, your general your preventers, they'll be acting a bit more on the swelling and mucus um, sort of plugging aspect of asthma, although they also have effects on smooth muscle in the longer term. So you would have seen this ladder is a BTS sign sort of guidelines um, 
treatment ladder for chronic asthma and it changes almost every year they can never agree with nice however it looks like they're now kind of coming up to an agreement together and we should watch this space because there'll be new joint guidelines be released but the main principle that you want to bear in mind is it's going to be a step-by-step -step process where you try one thing and see if it works and reassess over time um it's not just about the medications what you're looking for are things like adherence uh, you know, technique of using the inhalers, making sure that patients um, avoid triggers, you know, if they have pets, if there's problems with their housing and dust and mites, these are all things that can be avoided without the need for medications. Um, and then every patient should have a personalised asthma plan. This is very important, shown to be very effective in reducing exacerbation of asthma. Now, if you're in primary care um, and you think that your patient is just not responding to the treatment, early specialist input, it's recommended and shouldn't be delayed if your patient is quickly maxing out their therapy without any benefit. So a bit of a mouthful of a slide, but just covering, um, these are the main steps I'm sure you would have heard of. Um, I'll, I've broke, split it up into seven points, but bear in mind that points three, four, and five are the most, more, most contentious between NICE and BTS, and they're just in a slightly different order between the two of them. Now, the majority, you know, both NICE and BTS will agree that you should always start with a Saba reliever inhaler that will be often sort of your first line uh, therapy, just trial. But most patients should be started on a preventer inhaler at the same time. You know, don't rely on salbutamol to be your fix. If you're going to treat asthma, you need to give them a preventer inhaler to reduce that long-term inflammation. Um, and it will depend on, you know, how symptomatic the patient is and whether you've got objective features of asthma, you know, you've had some spirometry and things like that. Now, the next few steps involve either a sequence of trialing some leukotriene antagonists such as Montelukast, um, combining your ICS with a long-acting bronchodilator such as salmeterol, um, or you could try MART where you have a low-dose combination of ICS and LABA um, together with, you know, instead of having the reliever and the ICS um, for maintenance. And then again, you just go up with the doses until you've sort of maxed it out. You've tried a little bit of everything and if that didn't work, then you would go to a specialist. Um, obviously at the very bottom of, of well, at the top of the ladder, you have your oral steroids, which you know have lots and lots of side effects. And we really need to try and avoid getting patients to that step if we can. Okay, so next question. Ah, this has caused a little bit of uh, a little bit of debate. So, in fact, this is what Nice recommends. Um, your first line investigation for asthma is, which is pheno, so measuring the fractional exhaled nitric oxide. The reason why it's recommended as first line is, first of all, it can be done in pretty much all ages. I mean, very young children would struggle, but it's minimally invasive, can be carried out sort of in the community in its small settings without having to do full spirometry. And it gives you a pretty good idea of airway inflammation. So the higher the pheno, the more likely this is to be, uh, this is asthma. And, um, you know, it really gives you a good picture of the uh, inflammatory process in the airway. Um, so in terms of objective, we're talking about objective first line tests. Um, the top ones we'll be using are pheno, like I mentioned, and spirometry will be the next one. And you'll do spirometry with 
bronchodilator reversibility, sorry, that's what BDR stands for, which means, you know, you'll be giving patients subutamol and check whether the lung volumes are changing um, in response to subutamol. Other things you'd ask a patient to do is, like some of you rightly answered, whether it's not first line, is a peak expiratory peak expiratory flow diary, um, when you usually ask for two weeks patients to keep a measure of their peak flow in the morning and the night. And if there is a more than 20% or 20% variation during the day with a predisposition for it to be worse at night, then it's more likely to be asthma or at least it corroborates your diagnosis of asthma. And you might even see patterns of whether asthma is occupational if you're doing a peak expiratory flow you know, for two weeks. If there's something that triggers a patient when they're, say, at home on the weekend or in the office during the week, it's a very good indication. Other things that you might want to check, you can do a direct bronchial challenge test. Um, this is a bit more unusual. It's usually reserved for patients with a borderline pheno when you're not sure. Um, you know, spirometry is also not clear, but you still have a high suspicion of asthma. Um, you might do a chest x-ray to make sure there isn't anything else going on. Um, other indication of asthma are high eosinophils in a full black count or IgE. You might be doing, especially in children, sort of specific IgE to known antigen like a tree pollen and dust mites and things like that and allergy testing. And then ultimately, with most patients, you'll do a treatment trial and that will give you the answers to whether this really is asthma. So we've mentioned spirometry. I'm not going to go too much into it because you could spend hours talking about lung volumes. Uh, but really, when, when we talk about asthma, we're interested in the dynamic lung volumes. If you remember the static and dynamic lung volumes um, that you can measure, and the dynamic lung volumes are the ones that are affected by the speed of airflow. So here we're really talking about the forced expiratory volume in one second, FV1, and the FVC vital capacity. So what you'll see when patients do spirometry is on the right is a flow volume loop, which shows you the inspiration phase and the expiration phase of breathing. Um, now, when we talk about asthma, we're talking about an obstructive process. So the left-hand side of this table is really most useful. And obviously the etiology of obstruction <laughs> is that you can't really get uh, in or out as easily. So your FV1 will usually be uh, less than 80% of what's predicted. Your FVC may be reduced because you do have some reduction in sort of capacity of your lungs, but not to the same extent as the FV1 which means you'll get a ratio that's less than 0 0.7 if you do the ratio of the FEV1 over FEC. Um, so then once you've got to this point, really to differentiate between asthma and COPD, you'll be doing a bronchodilator reversibility test. Um, and if it is reversible, then that points towards asthma. Now bear in mind, that's not strictly foolproof. That's what you should say in the exams, but in reality, someone who's got decent asthma control or perhaps who's taking their in, um, steroid inhalers might not really have very much of a bronchodilator re reverse reversibility response. Now, the restrictive part of this table refers more to other conditions like fibrosis or a musculoskeletal condition where the actual volume of the lung is reduced for a reason or the other, either intrinsically or extrinsically. And that will actually give you a higher ratio of FEV1 over FVC or a near normal ratio um, because both of them are reduced by a similar amount. Um, so, and so just to say for asthma diagnosis in adults, what we look for in terms of reversibility is a 12% mark of reversibility. But like I mentioned, you know, that's for new diagnosis, but once someone's already got asthma and you're doing lung functions, then that might not strictly be um, as you expect. Okay, so third question.
Whew, the room is really divided on this one. <laughs> okay, this is a little bit of a trick question, but this kind of stuff might come up on your exam. So just be aware of these definitions. So in this case, we're looking at a near fatal asthma attack. And the key really is that PaCO2 of 6.7. So that's a high CO2, which you should hope to never see in an asthma attack because it means the patient is becoming really fatigued and stop taking as deep breaths. The areas are so obstructed that the CO2 starts building up. So talking about asthma, acute asthma severity, right? These are your patients coming into A&E. Very important to be able to grade asthma attacks to be able to manage them, first of all, in the appropriate place. Okay, so we're talking about a moderate acute asthma attack when a patient has a peak expiratory flow of between 50 and 75% and no other features of greater severity. Very important, okay? A severe acute asthma attack has any one of the following. So if you have any of these, it classes as severe. So a PFR of between 35 to 50, so below that 50% mark, elevated respiratory rate of equal or above to 25, a heart rate that's also, so the tachycardic at 110 or above, and they might not be able to complete sentences in one breath, so patients are becoming puffed out. Again, if you have any features of life-threatening um, asthma, then that's what we class it as, okay? So in life-threatening, you have a low, even lower peak expiratory flow, you start <laughs> seeing how this goes, and they'll become hypoxic at this point, or well, they might become hypoxic with SAPs of less than 92, but you still have a normal CO2. And in fact, a normal CO2 isn't reassuring in these patients because, you know, they have a high respiratory rate if it's a severe attack, which means it should be hyperventilating. And the fact that they're becoming hypoxic with a normal CO2 means the patient is tiring out. You know, there might be silent chest, which is another one of those horrible things you hope to never hear. And because they're hypoxic, patient might start becoming agitated with some altered GCS perhaps or hypertensive so you start getting signs of hemodynamic instability and the near fatal attack is when that CO2 is starting to rise um, so quite significant. Now when it comes to the management of acute asthma you might have heard some acronyms which I'm not going to repeat in this lecture because it goes on YouTube <laughs> but there's a variety of them the main things you really should be thinking about is, right, if this patient is very sick, they should be managed in recess. Very important. You know, anything that's above sort of severe asthma attack should be managed in recess and start preparing as to whether this patient should really go to ITU. So most patients will receive oxygen in the way or in another if they're quite unwell and, again, maintain target stats as sort of above 94. Then what you do is give them subutamol. Now, if a patient is not too puffed out, MDIs surprisingly actually deliver more subutamol than a nebulizer. Um, even though people think nebulizers are so much better than MDIs, MDIs deliver more drug if used correctly. Now, if a patient is really tired and non-compliant and maybe a bit confused or they need oxygen, then a nebulizer is better because you can do oxygen-driven nebulizers. You don't have to swap between an MDI and not oxygen. Next thing will be steroids. Now, the vast majority of patients should have oral prednisolone. Although we think that IV hydrocortisone sounds like it's more effective, oral prednisolone is pretty good if the patient can take it. And bear in mind that the dose recommended is now 40 milligrams. So although it used to be 30 for asthma attack, now it's 40. And in fact, even in COPD, I believe now they're moving on to 40 milligrams um, for treating this condition. Now, the sort of more hardcore things is, you know, if none of these have really worked or the patient's peak expiratory flow is still a bit rubbish, things you might think of adding on is iprotropium, which often will just get added onto subutinal if you're giving NEBS, you know, without waiting to see if the patient is getting better. Um, IV magnesium sulfate, 
Um, instead is one that you might think a little bit more about. The patient needs to be on a cardiac monitor, so even more reason to move the patient to resus and IV aminophilin as well, if you're thinking this patient is having a fatal or life-threatening asthma attack. And again, to check whether your patient is getting better, you know, you'll get them to do peak flows and check if it's getting it you know, any better. If the patient can do a peak flow, that's already a pretty decent sign that the asthma attack is getting a bit better. Uh, but most of these patients, especially if it's been quite severe, should be observed for at least 24 hours in hospital. Um, you know, they can really topple quickly if they've had a severe asthma attack. Okay, question four. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Seems so unimportant, but actually checking a patient's inhaler technique and compliance is absolutely key when someone's had an asthma attack. And in fact, that will be the answer most of the time as to why someone is has become unwell if they have diagnosed asthma, you know, unless it's a new diagnosis. Um, so when we talk about safe discharge and asthma, very important to make a lot of safety netting you know these patients really can die from asthma attacks um, so make sure that their expiratory flow is back to above 75 percent of their baseline um, you know if someone's had a mild you know moderate asthma attack as long as their peak expiratory flow has returned to baseline within an hour they can be discharged from a e but not if they've had a severe life-threatening attack um, so they should be off oxygen and off nebulizers for 24 hours if that's what they needed. Like we mentioned, you should always check the compliance of the technique and they should have an updated asthma uh, management plan so they're personalized. And um, I know definitely in pediatrics, asthma nurses are very, very good at making sure this gets done. But lots of hospitals will also have asthma nurses or respiratory nurses that will go through this with patients and um, through their technique. Patients may need uh, to complete a course of steroids um, and ideally, although I must say I'm not sure this is, this is done very often, especially with the current constraints, uh, but the patient should be reviewed in the community within 48 hours. I mean, this is definitely true for children, but for adults, sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, and if they've had an asthma attack, which has required hospitalization, they should have a respiratory follow-up within a month. So this is an example of an asthma, a personalized asthma plan. Lots of you know hospitals and departments have their own. I'm sure you'll trust might have a different one. Maybe go on the respiratory ward and see if you can get hold of one. It really does give you a bit of an idea of what we tell patients when they have asthma, but what to look out for, when to come to hospital, and you know how to take their medications. All right, let's move on. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well done, guys. Yes, it is smoking cessation. We should never get tired of saying this. And remember to make every contact count <laughs> to stop your patients from smoking, especially when it comes to COPD. So compared to asthma, COPD is also an obstructive airway condition, which is chronic, but has a little to no reversibility. And it will progress if smoking continues. However, also true that once a certain degree of damage is done, even if the patient stops smoking, you know, the condition won't be reversible and some damage can still be sustained over time, you know, through more inflammatory and destructive processes within the airways. Um, now, the presentation of these patients can look similar to asthma. Um, however, your demographic tend to be um, different, you know, it tends to be in patients that um, a more, you know, they're older than 35, often have a smoking history. If they don't and they're young, then they might have a family history of young onset COPD, in which you might want to think about screening for, you know, alpha-1 antitrypsin and other similar conditions. And um, they'll often have a chronic shortness of breath, a cough that's productive more than dry compared to asthma, and the diurnal variation will be minimal. So you know, the cough and the shortness of breath will be the same in the morning and at night. And now when it comes to diagnosis of COPD, um, you know, compared to asthma where we did, you know, um, recommended a pheno, um, doing spirometry with FEV1, it's one of the best ways uh, to at least look at the severity of COPD and diagnose this particular condition. Um, in a lot of patients, you will have to do a chest x-ray, especially if they have a persistent cough that's not resol resolving and what you might see it's what's on the right which is a classic barrel shaped chest of a patient with COPD with hyper expansion which means you usually see more than six six to eight ribs um, it's a good idea of hyper expansion you can also see a little bit of the lung bulging in between the ribs another sign of hyper expansion and sort of lots of black <laughs> space in the lungs um, but a chest x-ray is also very useful to exclude things like malignancy. Now, COPD has a huge impact on patients' lives and is very correlated with depression and anxiety. So it's important for these patients to have a good support network. Okay, next question. caught you out here guys <laughs> so the very the first mode of oxygen delivery they will use in this patient is actually a nasal cannula and this is you know talking in real terms right if someone's hypoxic with a saturation of 87 percent you wouldn't faff around with a venturi mask especially because not all COPD patients are chronic retainers of CO2 and hypoxia kills okay and hypoxia often kills first so very important to target that before you worry about rising levels of co2 however having said that absolutely very important to give targeted therapy to copd patients you know if there's any concerns of chronic co2 retention and you know the reality is you hear this all the time about COPD, you know, SATs of 88 to 92, very important not to over oxygenate them, which is true to an extent. But at the same time, you need to treat the patient one by one, you know, in their own physiology. 
And the only way really you're going to know whether they are a chronic retainer is if you do an arterial blood gas. So if someone is hypoxic in A&E and they have COPD, you're going to have to do that. I mean, you can estimate it from venous. Sometimes, especially respiratory consultants, aren't too keen on venous blood gases to estimate bicarbonate. Although there's plenty of research that says that they're very comparable. <laughs> and that's really what you'll be looking out for when it comes to um, retention of CO2. Look at the bicarbonate on a blood gas. And if it's more than 28, then yes, the patient is a chronic CO2 retainer and they should receive targeted oxygen therapy with a Venturi mask. Um, and this all goes back, you know, this whole thing about CO2 and COPD goes back to the fact that patients that have uh, chronic CO2 retention will become sens desensitized to the effects of CO2 on respiratory drive and rely on hypoxia to keep breathing. Um, so it's important for them to be on a slightly hypoxic scale of 88 to 92 percent when it comes to saturation. And, you know, for someone who doesn't know the patient, these stats may look alarming, uh, but they're actually near normal. Um, and yes, in these particular patients, oxygen is dangerous um, and you will be wanting to deliver oxygen through a venturi system. Um, but again, if this is the first time you've seen a patient, you've just walked into the a &E cubicle and you're about to take a history and they're hypoxic, just give them a bit of oxygen, get a blood gas, and then you'll have your answer pretty quickly. Well done, absolutely. So this question really exemplifies the point I was making earlier that not all COPD patients are chronic CO2 retainers. And in fact, some patients are just hypoxic and you know when they're not acutely unwell, they remain hypoxic with a low CO2. And these patients um, are the ones who will benefit the most from long-term oxygen therapy. Now, it's very important that your patients are non-smokers. And I cannot stress this enough. Sometimes patients will tell you because they need the oxygen that they don't smoke. And very, very important that you have, you make sure these patients have a home oxygen assessment. Someone actually goes to their home and make sure that there are no cigarettes, there's no smell of smoke because oxygen plus fire, big problems. Okay, and this has happened. Um, but what you're looking for in these patients is someone was chronically hypoxic and the mark that you'll be looking at is a PO2 of less than 7.3 on at least two occasions at least three months apart despite having tried everything including smoking cessation and maximizing your medical therapy and um, you might go for a slightly higher PO2 if there are other complications such as polycythemia there's pulmonary hypertension or peripheral edema, so, you know, they're starting to get core pulmonale, and um, these sort of issues, then you might give them oxygen therapy a bit sooner. And the one I've put on the right is your home oxygen order form, which when you're an F1 or an F2, and you'll be working in respiratory medicine, you'll become very familiar with, and you'll be doing plenty of these a day. And just to bear in mind, remember, if patients have stairs, they need two concentration, concentrator, one downstairs and one upstairs. Here's my tip for you today. <laughs> so talking about ABGs really quickly, we've mentioned them earlier and we've seen a couple of them. So quick way to look at ABGs. 
Um, you know, if you have a bit of a struggle with them, I'm not going to go into too much detail with them, but you can practice this anytime. Pick up a couple of ABGs and have a look. But the first thing you always be looking at is the pH. So you'd be looking at is a pH acidotic or alkalotic, right? Is it high? Is it low? Once you've got the pH, you can then move on to looking at the CO2. Is the CO2 high or low? AKA, does it justify, does it explain the pH? So if the pH is low and the CO2 is high, then you can say that that is a respiratory acidosis. And if the pH is high and the CO2 is low, then it's a respiratory alkalosis. And you've already kind of got to that stage. Now, you can look at the bicarbonate at that point. Is it high or is it low? Now, a kind of mnemonic is to think Rome, so respiratory opposite, metabolic equal, which means if the bicarbonate and the CO2 um, go in the same direction, then you're looking at a, sorry, if the pH and the bicarbonate go in the same direction, you're looking at a metabolic um, explanation for your acid-base imbalance. And bear in mind, like we said earlier, if the CO2 is high, but the bicarbonate is also high, then and the pH is normal, then what you're looking at is a compensated situation, which is a bit hard to tell what's going on. It is likely to be a respiratory acidosis, like in a COPD patient that is metabolically compensated. And remember that metabolic compensation takes time. So unless you're a child and you can really pump up that bicarbonate really quickly, most adults will take orders of you know, hours to days to be able to concentrate enough bicarbonate to meet that, uh, that imbalance with CO2. And um, so it's a much slower adaptation compared to um, you know, your respiratory system. Just a bit of an overview. I hope it's not too, it's not kind of makes sense, but I don't want to spend too much time thinking about ABGs. Okay. So next question. Very good. A little contentious. I can see why, you know, some people thought that the respiratory ward would be enough because in reality, that's probably where a lot of these patients will be. But if you go so, you know, solely by the CURB 65 score, then this patient should be in the intensive care unit. Okay. Now the practicalities of that, and you know, we can debate another time, but <laughs> Talking about the CURB 65 uh, score in pneumonia, you know, without the U, if you're in primary care and obviously you can't get urea. So um, you're looking at confusion, urea, high respiratory rate, low blood pressure and age over 65 years. And bear in mind this score, the reason why it's so important is because if you score three or more points, it actually correlates really well with risk of mortality. And in fact, a score of three or more carries a 22% mortality. Um, so, you know, these patients, when they're quite sick, they should really be managed in the appropriate environment. So obviously, if someone scores zero, they can be managed in the community. If they score one and they're not hypoxic, they can be managed in the community with some antibiotic cover. But when they start scoring two, they really should have IV antibiotics and should be admitted into hospital. If they score three, you should at least get ITU to C, and four, ITU is really indicated. 
And I know that a patient who's 78 years old might not make it to ITU in the UK, but in lots of other countries they would, you know, and that's a separate debate as to whether they should be in ITU or not. But according to this school, that's what's recommended. Okay, so repeat chest x-ray, absolutely. So when patients have pneumonia, this is one of the things that you'll be organizing a lot of the time if you're a junior in hospital. Um, bear in mind that for COVID pneumonitis is 12 weeks, um, but the follow-up for pneumonia is six weeks, hospitalized pneumonia. So just touching upon a pneumonia, divided usually into community acquired pneumonia or hospital acquired. Remember it counts as community acquired if it's within 48 hours of admission that it becomes overt. Um, and hospital acquired can be if the patient has been discharged within two weeks, you know, if they come back into hospital and they were in hospital recently. So worth bearing in mind these definition. Now the very most common pathogens in adults at least are streptococcus pneumonia and Haemophilus influenza. There are some weird and wondrous ones that it's worth knowing about, really, for exams reasons, which are Legionella, Mycoplasma, and Chlamydia. Um, usually, if a patient is not responding to the first line antibiotics, um, and you know, until you have a culture, um, then you might think that this is, you might start thinking that this is an atypical pneumonia, especially if they have features that are not consistent with normal pneumonia. Sometimes you might not have such obvious consolidation as you have in this chest X-ray with some of the atypical agents, or they might have a particular history. Um, chlamydia, often, you know, patients that keep birds, is one to keep in mind. Um, but otherwise you'll be treating as a typical pneumonia unless you have a sputum or strong suspicion. If the pneumonia is recurrent or there are other risk factors, such as patients with unsafe swallow, patients have had strokes, patients with Parkinson's, then you should be thinking about aspiration, and making sure that your antibiotics have some gram negative cover. But your antibiotics that you use in pneumonia will generally be guided by your local guidelines. Um, I know when I worked in respiratory a few years back, Comoxiclav was the holy grail. I think it still very much is, at least, at least in my region, but I know some places prefer other agents like Cipro and things like that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well done. So this really fits mostly with pneumothorax and um, pulmonary embolism. 
yes, you might consider that. And surely, you know, you would first start with the chest X-ray. And if there wasn't any pneumothorax, then you'd be sending the patient straight for a CTPA. Um, but here, the big uh, mark is, you know, is a young man um, with sharp pain, who's hypoxic, normal temperature, tachypnic. It all kind of fits with pneumothorax, really. So here's a chest X-ray of pneumothorax. And I hope you can see on that right hand side, this patient has a pretty significant pneumothorax that spans the whole length of the lung and um, there's no tracheal deviation. So there's, you know, we don't have concerns of this being a tension pneumothorax, but it is a pretty chunky one. And these lung fields don't look entirely normal. So I suspect this is probably not the lungs of a 22 year old, even though he smokes lots and lots of cannabis. Um, they're a bit hyper expanded. I suspect this patient has some other features of lung disease. Haha, <laughs> room is divided here too. All right. So yeah, this is a bit of a tricky one. It really requires you to know what you do with a 1.5 centimeter, what looks like a spontaneous you know, primary pneumothorax. But it is worth bearing in mind, this kind of stuff does come up in exams, especially when it comes to um, the size of the pneumothorax and what to do. So this is a very... Um, nice summary of the BTS guidelines, which has actually been done by a Reddit user who's made this open source, which is great because I find the BTS guidelines for pneumothorax really confusing to look at. Um, and I think this is done a bit better. So if we look at a spontaneous pneumothorax, this is what we're talking about, rather than a traumatic pneumothorax. Um, so spontaneous pneumothorax could happen in someone who has no previous lung history, you know, disease, there will be a primary pneumothorax. If it's someone who has, um, you know, any underlying lung disease, uh, they're old with a smoking history, then we're talking about a secondary pneumothorax. So in primary pneumothorax, like a 22 year old, um, if the pneumothorax is less than two centimeters and the patient is not breathless, then we might think of discharging the patient. Um, however, um, if, you know, if the patient is symptomatic, then we might want to aspirate this pneumothorax. And if the size is more than two centimeters, we definitely want to aspirate. So in this case, our patient was quite breathless and that's why aspiration will be appropriate, even though the pneumothorax was only 1.5 centimeters. Um, if that doesn't work and the patient is still very symptomatic or the pneumothorax gets any bigger, then we're thinking about putting in a chest strain and admitting the patient. In second genome of thorax, instead, there's further subdivisions. So if it's a very small pneumothorax with a size of less than one centimeter, um, you know, you might want to keep the patient in, give them oxygen if they're hypoxic and just watch them uh, because these patients have a high risk of the pneumothorax progressing to a bigger size if more of the lung collapses or if it's a bulla that's kind of burst in a patient with COPD, they can also have problems such as um, you know, hemothorax and stuff like that, if there's any involvement of blood vessels. Now, if it's a one to two centimeter pneumothorax, you might just aspirate a little bit and see if you can make it better and re-X-ray. Um, but if it's a large pneumothorax that so the patient is very symptomatic and this is a secondary pneumothorax, then you just go straight for a chest strain and admitting the patient.
Yes, very good. Absolutely. I can see where some of you would have put A. Um, and really the question here is about investigating the underlying cause, which in a patient of 73 um, with shortness of breath over a month um, with the unilateral pleural effusion makes us think of cancer really, at least that's the one that you really have to exclude. And a CT scan of the chest um, may not give you the answer as to what it is, you know, unless they have a lung mass, it's lung primary, um, uh, you know, it, with nodes and things like that, you know, might give you an idea, but you might not necessarily see very much in a chest apart from effusion and not know what it is. Uh, but if you do aspirate and have a look at whether there's any protein, if there's, you know, is it infectious and you might send cytology of your plural aspirate, then it can give you an idea of what's in there really. Now, when it comes to plural effusions, we're talking about fluid in the plural space. Um, if there's fluid in the lung, that's pulmonary edema, uh, which can occur at the same time as a pulmonary effusion. Uh, but you know, just for <laughs> the correctness of definitions, we're talking about the pleural space. Um, things that you might see on a chest X-ray are in this particular image, for instance, we have a meniscus, so there's a fluid level. Um, you might not necessarily see it all the time if it's a very solid effusion or if it's very high up or the patient is not in the appropriate position to see a meniscus, you might not see it. Um, but that's one thing that you can look for. If it's a very large pleural effusion, you might see a trachea pushed away from the effusion. And that's because the effusion is taking up a lot of space in the chest wall and squashing everything else from the other, you know, opposite direction. Things that you might have picked up on examination like in our previous patients, there'll be decreased chest expansion, um, there'll be decreased breath sounds and vocal resonance, and you'll be looking for dullness to percussion. And in patients that do have large pleural effusions, this is very satisfying <laughs> to go and do because it is exactly what it sounds like, nothing. You know, it's completely quiet and it's very dull and it's a sign you can elicit very well. Now, if you aspirate this fluid, which you often do under ultrasound guidance, if there is enough of it, um, what you're looking for initially is the protein level. It'll be one of the results that comes out comes back first from the lab often. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye out if you've just sent an aspirate. And uh, your main distinction is whether the proteins are low, which makes this a transudate, um, or if the proteins are high, then this is an exudate. And if you have a borderline result, then you can use light criteria to decide whether this fits more with transudate or exudate. Um, now, if the pleural effusion is very large, if the patient is very symptomatic, um, you would have to you know, do therapeutic aspiration and put in a chest strain. Bear in mind, if this is a malignant effusion, uh, or the patient has, say, a mesothelioma, which is you know, a lung malignancy that causes lots and lots of fluid it can accumulate really quickly, then, you know, putting a chest strain might not be the answer, but often you'll start at least for symptomatic relief. You might need to reinsert later or rethink whether it really is appropriate for the patient. Now, likes criteria. Um, so I don't know how much you have to remember these from the top of your head. Maybe just remember that it exists, <laughs> uh, but um, we're talking about an exudate when more than one of the following criteria are met and a transudate doesn't meet any of these criteria, okay? So if you have a plural fluid protein of a serum protein of ratio of more than 0 0.5, or if you have a ratio of plural fluid of a serum lactate dehydrogenase of more than 0 0.6, um, or the plural fluid LDH is more than two thirds of the upper normal limit of serum LDH. Okay, so this, these really apply for your in-between figures between the 25 and 35 grams per litre. Um, now, exudative ca causes of an effusion, I mean, the most common is empyema, so an infective process. And the next most common that you'll be looking out for are malignant, especially in our patient with a unilateral effusion. Um, Things like pancreatitis, pulmonary embolism, rheumatoid arthritis can also cause uh, exudative effusions. 
Um, remember that in children, for instance, a unilateral pleural effusion is actually, you know, 99% of the time is infective, is not malignant, but in adults, it really is the other way around. Um, transitative causes instead, or things that will cause sort of fluid to leak out of the blood vessels into the pleural space. So your classics, cardiac failure, renal failure, liver failure, or low albumin because you have nephrotic syndrome or malnutrition in some countries, not so much in the UK. Okay, so 50, almost 50 50 thrombolysis, a treatment dose of low molecular weight heparin. And the winner is actually treatment dose low molecular heparin. If you answer the question, which is the next most appropriate intervention. Now, most of you have correctly recognized that this 30 year old who was collapsed is likely to have had a PE given the history of sudden chest pain and right calf tenderness. He is borderline hemodynamically unstable. He has a history of loss of consciousness. So this is likely to be a massive PE. So yes, it is true that this patient might need thrombolysis. However, thrombolysis needs to be very carefully you know, considered. Even in young men, even in young women with a PE, it's not a decision you'll be taking lightly. But treatment dose, low molecular weight heparin is sure for everyone. And if you're really thinking this is a PE, just give it, um, you know, compared to side effects of thrombolysis, much less, can be life-saving, and this will be your next most appropriate intervention. And then you can consider thrombolysis at a later stage. So if you're thinking about, this is very likely to be a PE, these are the things you'd be looking out for, um, and this is how you'd manage it. So you'd give high flow oxygen, uh, you know, depending on the saturations so of the hypoxic, obviously, um, they might need some significant analgesia with morphine and antiemetics. Not all patients need them, to be honest, but if you are going to give them, make sure you give some antiemetics with that. Um, they can be very uncomfortable. And then what you look for is, is the patient hemodynamically stable? If they're stable, you do a low molecular weight heparin, um, which, you know, it's a life-saving treatment. If they're unstable, you will consider thrombolysis with alteplase. Again, the key word here is consider. In a lot of patients who are hemodynamically unstable, you still go with low molecular weight heparin first. Um, so this is something you will become familiar with as doctors all the time, which is a well score. You'll be calculating it multiple amounts of time and you need to convince radiology you need that CTPA. Um, and really, you know, if a well score is more or equal than four, then P is likely and you should get a CTPA. But the, if the well score is less than four, then you should really be getting a D-dimer first to check whether it's elevated. And the picture here on the left shows a very nice saddle embolus that goes all across the pulmonary tree. So talking about D-dimers and um, CTPA, very quick word, because we're running a little bit late. Um, so D-dimers are great for ruling out peas, but they're very non-specific. Okay, if you have a high well score or a very high suspicion that this is a PE, then really there's no point in doing a D-dimer because you can have false positives, you know, if the patient has got any infection, heart, you know, problems with the heart failure, things like that, they might have a high D-dimer. Patients who are pregnant will certainly have high D-dimer, so no point in doing in pregnant women you suspect to have PE. And patients with malignancy very often will also have a high D-dimer, so not so good. So CTPA is the gold standard for PE diagnosis. 
um, with a very high specificity and good positive predictive value. Um, but again, you know, drawbacks are there's radiation involved, there's contrast involved. Not all patients can have it, especially the ones with renal disease. Um, so, in you know, you might have to consider whether it's likely to be a P. Um, you know, radiology will often ask for a chest X-ray first unless it's a blatant P. And again, this is a summary of what I've just told you, really. OK, we're getting there. I think this might be the last question. Yes, this is really what we talked about earlier. She kind of fits all the criteria for potential of being malignancy. And it's the one thing that you'd have to exclude really in this patient. So just a very final word on lung cancer. Um, lung cancer is the third most common cancer in the UK, but the leading cause of cancer related deaths and smoking is implication in 80% of cases. You know, even though there's types of lung cancer that are more common in non-smokers, smoking is still the very major risk factor. Now, lung cancer really quickly is divided into two main categories, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer is then subdivided in further categories. The most common are adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Also large cell carcinoma, which is a fair bit rarer than the other two. You then have more obscure rare, rare types of lung cancer, such as carcinoid tumours and mesotheliomas, which technically not quite lung cancer, <laughs> but um, they also feature in this group. And I'm not going to spend very much time talking about these because they will take a whole lecture by themselves. But just the main point pointers for you guys to know, remember, if we look at the main types of lung cancer, so squamous cell adenocarcinoma, which are non-small cell cancers, and small cell carcinoma are the main ones you will encounter both in clinical practice and in your exams. Now, worth bearing in mind that although squamous cell carcinoma used to be the most common type of cancer, it is not anymore. Adenocarcinoma is now the most common type of lung cancer, so don't get caught out by these questions. Now, if you compare the cells types, squamous cells are epithelial cells, and um, primarily you will have central lesions. So the reason why these patients are picked up a little bit earlier than patients who have adenocarcinoma or small cell carcinoma is because they might present with hemoptysis, which is very frightening for patients and they go to the GP or to a &E, and then they get picked up a little bit sooner. And squamous cell carcinoma also tends to metastasize a little bit later. So it carries a slightly better prognosis than adenocarcinoma and small cell carcinoma. And um, when we talk about paraneoplastic syndrome, which is the other thing people love to ask in exams about lung cancer, squamous cell carcinoma is the one that is associated with hypercalcemia due to secretion of parathyroid uh, related peptide. OK, now. Adenocarcinoma is the one that you all mostly remember for because it is the cancer that's most common in non-smokers, but it is still very common in smokers, <laughs> okay? So don't get confused with that. It is a cancer of the mucous cells and it tends to um, have peripheral lesions, you know, peripheral distribution. So actually this cancer can be picked up quite late, which is very sad. And it also metastasizes quite early, so it carries pretty poor prognosis. and in terms of neoplastic syndromes, hypertrophic pulmonary osteopathy is one you might get with adenocarcinoma. Not a favorite of exams. I haven't heard of this very much. Small cell carcinoma is the deadliest lung cancer. Spreads early, is caught very late. Patients that don't receive chemotherapy have a very poor prognosis. You know, we're talking about weeks. 
Um, and it's a tumor of neuroendocrine cells, which tends to have central lesions. So it also be peribronchial. Um, and you think that maybe like squamous cells will be picked up early, but the big problem is that it metastasizes very early, even when it's a very small tumor. Um, so chemotherapy is really the answer here and lots of patients just don't make it. Um, but small cell carcinoma, because it's a, a cancer of neuroendocrine cells, is the one with the most interesting <laughs> neuroparaneoplastic syndrome for exams. So things like syndrome of inappropriate ADH, Cushing's, and lumbar etone syndrome are all associated with small cell carcinoma. Okay, 